Hello, my fellow readers. This is I, Dark Symphony 777, with a fan fiction reading. As always, a link to the store will be in the description below. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, click on that bell for notifications, leave a comment in the comment section below on your thoughts of the story, and if you, excuse me, any future fan fictions you want me to read or review, and any, if you want to keep up to date to my channel, as well as talk to me, please join my Discord. So the story I am reading is Take Shelter. It's a political animals, some kind of political show, written by Brian Rose. I, I, I'm more likely butchered the hell out of that name. I have no idea how to pronounce it. And it's a family hurt and comfort story, so let's get into it. The White House was in a flurry of activity, one that accompanied the occasional, the occasion surpassing even presidential elections, the handoff of an administration. Are you boys sure you don't want to head to the farm with us after the inauguration? Elaine asked as she put on her jewelry, but rolled his eyes, and reached to help her with her necklace. Sugar, you asked every ten minutes since they got up. I think after eight years, they deserve the chance to blow off some steam. It's their first night without professional babysitters. They both just got their driver's license. Let them stretch their legs a bit. That's only because they beat the age cut off by five weeks. They're barely sixteen, she shot back. The farm isn't that close. It'll get late quickly. Plus, the weather service issued a winter storm advisory. Mom, we'll be fine. It's just like Party Sam's throwing for us at his house. With some kids from school, then we'll spend the night there, so you're not worried about us driving late. Snow or no snow, and come out in the morning, TJ cut in. Elaine fussed over his, shoot, his suit jacket and tied, straightening everything. Well, I may trust Sam and his parents, but it doesn't mean I trust all your friends. Oh, come on, that was an accident almost a year ago. Was it also an accident that... What's his name? Brought alcohol to that party. You had ten stitches and a knee brace for six weeks. Almost a year later, and you still complain it hurts sometimes. We all know to what end that came. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, TJ rolls his eyes. You said you trust Sam's parents. They're like the alcohol Nazis. Pipe Douglas from the master bedroom. As I recall, the same what's-his-name also tried to spike your drink, TJ, thinking he might get a little action lane powered on. Being gay does not mean that suddenly every guy is secretly up to get me. God, Mom. He, and he's not even coming to this one, complained TJ. Language warm, bud. Douglas took their mother's soldiers. They were as tall as her now. Nothing is going to happen. I'll keep an eye on him, and I'll have my phone charger just to make sure he can't die on me. Great, so I can get to trade in the babysitters with guns for one with a massive ego. You trust him, you just don't trust me, TJ grumbled. Thomas! Elaine stepped around Douglas to check her makeup in the mirror one last time. Nana's car should be here any minute to pick you two up. If there's anything you want before you get back to the farm, make sure it's in a bag and take it with you. Everything left in the residence is getting packed up and shipped. And make sure you wear to wear your heavier coats. Will they at least bring us after the ceremony so we can get to get our car? Asked Douglas. Yes, they can do that. I'll make sure to let Stanley know it stays put. A knock at the door drew all their attention. Speaking of the house staff, that's probably your cue. See you there. We love you. In spite of their obvious teenage disdain, she kissed them both on the forehead. TJ composedly straightened his gelled hair in response. Dude, what's it like? So what's it like to finally be free? Sam asked over the DJ. Douglas put the foosball on his goal with a satisfying whack. One, it's not like we were born there. I remember how it felt before. Two, it's like I can breathe again. You know, the mall got too crowded. Secret service was right there. Girlfriend tried to hug you unexpectedly. They're right there. Friends tried to prank you on your birthday. People almost got arrested. Well, that was a fun day, though. <laughs> That's actually a funny image if you think about it. It's like, it's just a prank! No! No, you tried to insult a presidential family member. No, it was a prank, bro! No! No! Sorry, I, I, that happens sometimes. But it was epic. Douglas took the chance and he swiped his Red Bull to glance around the room. Wait, Red Bull in the 90s? I didn't know that. And the enemy spot TJ and Drillin yanked out of the moment. Hey, Jack, tap it for me, will ya? I, I just gotta ask my brother something real quick. I can be back before Sam has any points on the table. So it had been coming down steadily since the end of the inauguration speeches. The only light left in the morning in the sky was City... Glow reflecting off the cloud cover in white blanket already coating DC. Wait, the only light left in the sky, city glow reflecting. Okay. I was reading around. I thought it was worded badly, but then I reread it and it's like, oh, it's fine. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, Douglas really free wondered how well their brand new Mustang was going to do in the morning. But he wasn't going anywhere with certain things, anyway. After one wide loop and checking the major cluster kids, the lump began to form in his stomach. And then he saw a boy and girl slipping from the back door, nose red from the cold, but only one cup between them. Around the corner, just outside the security light on that side, another couple pressed against the brickwork of the house. TJ's ridiculous hair and sweat. Are you nuts? It's like 50 degrees on your sl- His thumbs 
his own arm planted over his chest. The couple jumped apart. The other boy, Christopher Douglas, pretty sure his snake snickered. Over here, it's hot. TJ was much less pleased. Do you mind? As you can probably tell, there wasn't exactly a lot of room to spare inside. I just haven't seen you in a while, and wanted to make sure everything was okay. We're not in elementary school anymore. We're not in the White House anymore. So go have your own fun if that's still possible. Were you seriously going to spy me for mom? No, I was... I thought you might... Look, I didn't mean to step in the middle of something, bullshit, Christopher. Maybe it was Zach. You didn't. He's just my brother, and he's going out. So the paralyzed crew calls for him, TJ countered. But the kid was already gone. Thanks. We weren't doing anything you wouldn't do. He pulled a small bottle from his jean pocket, shook something out, and popped whatever it was in his mouth. Douglas stared at his twin. And what was that supposed to be? My knees bugged me. Play off. DJ snatched the bottle before TJ could hide again. Bullshit. I did the same thing to my knee in baseball three years ago, and I didn't need... Cod... Codine? Codine? Medicine name weird. I can't pronounce that. You can't expect to pronounce any medicine name. High chlorine, uh, and amphetamines, um, uh, amplify. There we go. Adderall. Ritalin. There we go. I can't pronounce that. Uh, a year afterwards. Who'd you get this from, and, by the way? Language, Dougie, T said in a mocking invitation of their dad. We're doing this again? Really? Mom and Pat had a heart attack when she found out last time. Like, Cora's gonna run, tell her, like, good little snidoir. DJ's sarcastic expression didn't flinch as Douglas grabbed him by the shirt and pushed him back. Uh, pushed him back against the wall. Before either of them could say anything, however, the door opened around the corner and the voice called out. Douglas, TJ, are you out here? The pizza just arrived. It was a girl's voice. Lindy, Douglas's girlfriend. How many did you just take? Douglas redoubled his grip when TJ didn't answer. Tell me. I want to know if I'm going to have to explain to the Petersons why my brother's tring all over his ass or not. Were he? The lower dust than I got in the past, T.G. Grudgingly, grudgingly conceded. Get inside and get some pizza and water. Maybe that will at least make it less obvious. I don't care if you're sucking face with someone. At least do it with a coat on. Sure, Mom. You know, tonight was supposed to be a fun, about fun and freedom. T. showed past Douglas's shoulder to head for the door. A couple deep breaths was followed. Lindsay waited, waited beside her, a certain concerned fresh on her. Everything okay? Do you my favorite brother? That's all. I don't come starving. A couple energy drinks, some slices of pizza, and a few round dance over the later. Wait, this is the late 90s. Did they, did they dance dance revolution exist in the 90s? Uh, I'm curious. Okay, so apparently Dance Dance Revolution was first created in 1998. Huh, you learned something new. Uh, 6 p.m. turned into 11.30 p.m. Kids started to trickle home. The DJ packed up for the night. Douglas realized his phone was almost dead. That's when he got the text message. P-T-M-C, uh, uh, I'm guessing this is underground. Club, okay, but S save our skin. Uh, TJ. Okay. His mouth fell open the longer he stared at the phone screen. The Pato Mac underground. Okay, so I'm right. Was on the far side of town. When did TJ leave? And how much did he not? And how did he not notice? Douglas stared, glared out the window. Glanced out the window. My bad. Snow was coming down even harder now. The DJ had mentioned after the last song that weather reports projected as much as 14 inches before morning, and to be aware that the district was implementing a snow emergency starting at midnight until the trucks could put a dent in the roads. Crap. Sam! Sam! Douglas rushed over his, to his friend, who was at the door saying goodbye to people. Listen, apparently TG got sick of the party and hitched the ride with someone else back to the city for some reason. Now he's at her grandmother's place, but can't find his key. She gave each of us one, and she's still with her parents. I gotta go after him before this weather gets worse. It's a freaking ice age out there. You won't make it before the roads close, argued Sam. We'll just crash there. I can make it before midnight, alright? So, second chapter. I'm trying to figure out why this is, like, six chapters. It was 20 minutes from the Petersons to the club alone, but Douglas took the road as fast as he dared. Outside the shabby door, a figure huddled in the least stripped corner. TJ looked awful. Whether or not was standing, Douglas knew that look. Are you insane? Seriously, did you lose your mind as soon as dad was no longer in office? He couldn't help but exclaim as his brother stumbled into the car. I, I started... I want to... Okay. I started feeling not too great, so I told the others I was calling you to pick me up. None of them wanted to leave yet, yet I couldn't get enough si good enough signal, so I came out here, and then the weather thing came out, and then they shut everything down, and I couldn't find them. Sorry. 
You're never going to get back to the Petersons in time, or even Nana's at this point. That's where I told the Petersons we were going, but I lied about having a spare key while you somehow did it. Might as well head back to the farm, since it's out of town this direction. And they usually start with the high, early with the highways. Douglas put the car in gear, though he didn't like how it slid back around a bit to get going. Only when they had some, th- some moment, momentum did he get, let his anxiety get the better of him. So what did, what all did you take, TJ? What, what does that have to do with it? Don't jerk me around. You look like hell, and it's not just from being outside. I don't see what difference it would make. Aside from the medicine I cannot name, from earlier, what did you take at the club? I don't know. I don't, okay? There were pills passed around and other stuff. But you know I don't go that far. I can tell you I didn't drink any alcohol this time. I only used a fake ID to get in the door. We were having fun. It just became a blur. Speaking of blur, Douglas would nearly fishtail into a medium obscured by the snow as he turned left on the in- toward the interstate. Maybe they should have included these kind of conditions in driver's ed. The highway itself was marginally better, but still unnervingly slick. I should have thought of the near to the nearest hospital and headed for that. No, oh, it's not that bad, Dougie. I just need to warm up, get some sleep, and I'll be fine in the morning. You didn't realize how stupid that sounds, right? Now, right? Oh, just because you're Captain Perfect in Mom and Dad's eyes. That's not fair, TJ. Ever since that fight that got me suspended, or getting caught with the little airplane bottles of vodka. Airplane bottles of vodka? Um. What? <laughs> I don't get that part. Uh, which you were in too, by the way, or getting outed on national television, I just can't do anything right. You being outed had nothing to do with it, never did. And that was definitely not your fault, Douglas retorted. Mom and Dad sent me to a boarding school, as if that was going to magically straighten me out. Okay, did you really just say that? Your pawns are bad and you should feel bad! You know what I mean. You're running around sneaking off the clubs with a fake ID and popping medicine I cannot pronounce like it's candy and all sorts of other crap. Don't think I don't notice when you got cologne the hell out of a sweatshirt sometimes because it smells like pot. When we go with mom and dad on foreign trips and you try and pass the hangover off as jet lag. You got kicked out of that boarding school by Thanksgiving break for the record. I didn't I didn't know you kept a ring. Now look out! A curve turned sharper than it looked, owing to a red stop exit lane not far past the state line which puts the cap of the guardrail straight ahead. Tired but on edge, Douglas overcompensated, and their whole back end went sliding sideways. He kept expecting them to crash into something solid, but all they hit was a snowdrift that splashed a little way up to the driver's side roof. Damn it, he bellowed, pounding a fist on the steering wheel. We couldn't have just left the, the section on my issues for after we made it to the farm. Told the idea was crazy, TJ berated him. Well, you were the one who just couldn't suck it up and stay at the Petersons in the first place. We wouldn't have been, been in, even been in this mess, but no. No one else matters except for TJ. Come on, it can't be that hard for one of us to get on the push. We can be back out there in a few minutes. Well, that would be you, genius, since I'm already in the driver's seat, and my door is blocked by snow. At least give me your gloves. Mine are in my bag in the trunk, so they don't fit in these coat pockets. Douglas rolled his eyes and reluctantly handed them over. He shut off the radio so he would be able to hear outside over the engine. Okay, on the count of three, he felt the car rock a couple times, but the snow underneath quickly roared down to a sh- slight backward incline. Of course, they would find a dish to land in, and a Mustang of all cars. TJ reappeared, his front covered in kicked up slush. I just, I can't push it up by myself. He can't just stay here all night and we're with where it is now, either. Angrily, Douglas shut off the engine. Guess Mom was right to insist on those blankets and things in the trunk. The rest stop is 24 hours. I can't charge... I have to charge my phone. Wait, I just noticed something. Alright, I was just... I was just checking something to see if I actually... If I read this before or not. Okay. Um, let's see, where was I? Okay, okay. Uh, TJ reappeared, his front covered and kicked up slush. I can't push it up by myself. We can't stay here all night in here all night with where with where it is now either. Angrily Douglas shut off the engine. Guess Mom was right to insist on those blankets and things in the trunk. That rest stop is twenty four hour access. I have to charge my phone anyway. There should be an outlet where I can do that. Come on. They cleared the snow as much as possible to get their bags without burying them as soon as as soon as the trunk opened. Anything else useful will require a second trip. It was only maybe a two hundred foot walk to the little outbuilding, but it felt like a mile with the harsh winter. Halfway there, TJ was definitely having trouble with the deepening snow. Um, where was I? Okay. Okay. Maybe it was just from having been out in the cold longer, Douglas suspected. However, that whatever drugs his brother had taken were playing a part as well. Just gotta get this far enough, he grunted, using the door to pack the snow out of the way. Give me your bag, I'll slide those in, and then we can get inside. 
TJ nodded without saying anything. Despite any exposed sin scarring the turn red with cold, Douglas noted the sweat that clung to the fringe of hair around TJ's ears. After the bags, he ushered TJ in first. His twin nearly wiped out on the floor tile but on the doormat, thanks to the amount of melty snow on his lower extremities. Douglas barely caught him while avoiding getting stuck halfway in the door. He had always been a little bigger than TJ. I go, fine. I just stepped wrong is all. Again, I call bull. You got drug high written all over you. And even if I didn't know about earlier, how could you just take stuff without keeping track? What if something interacted or was tainted? What if someone did try to knock you out and do something? Dude, now you're worse than mom. I wasn't taking anything and everything from whoever walked by. But it was about living in the moment, letting yourself get swept away a bit. And you could use a little of that from time to time, you know. Do you at least remember a ballpark of how many? Mostly I stuck to my own stuff. Might have been some ex going around. I don't know. Just didn't want to think anymore. Douglas picked up and tossed their bags toward the middle of the space. Start getting out of those wet clothes. I don't need you getting sick on top of all this. I'll go out and get as much stuff at, as much as I can carry. How much change do you have in your wallet, by the way? Let's go. I'll let you know once I, once you get back. Once more, Douglas bundled up as best he could to venture out. Of all things, they had to pick a white Mustang. Oh, that's bad. That's actually bad. That's like as bad as if you're driving like a black car and at night. Oh, that would be bad. Uh, the blankets need, they needed for sure. First aid kit, probably a good idea. He looped the emergency lamp and radio onto his arm just in case. The rest stuff had indoor water fountains, so he wasn't going to bother with the case of water bottles. If he tried to carry anything else, he might sink entirely into the snow. The way things were going, now he just had to make the trek one more time. Immediately, he knew TJ would be no help. His brother was only halfway out of the clothes he had been wearing, sitting slumped against one wall, shivering. At least his eyes were open, that much Douglas could tell. But he wasn't doing well at, at all, no matter what he tried to say. Douglas did his best to squeeze everything through without dropping stuff in the snow or slipping and falling. TJ, hey, can you hear me? TJ only rocked his head in the direction of the question. Douglas would have to go with that. Can you tell me what's going on? Got real shaky all of a second. Wasn't sure I could stay standing. Feeling kind of sick. Now that can happen when you get carried away in the moment, sighed Douglas. He found a dry spot to put the stuff down, rustled out of his own sock, soaked sock, shoes, and coat, and started checking TJ over. So this chapter gets rather on the Swedish head, just a warning, but nothing is supposed to go away. What can I say? Drugs are bad. Okay. Drinking bad. Okay. Sorry, I had to, I had to go Mr. Minky. Uh, TJ Skate was burning up, his pulse racing. As if that wasn't enough, his breathing sounded a lot more labor than Douglas remembered. He had hoped it was just the exertion of the past several minutes. Ah, uh, TJ, hang in there. I'll get something to cool you down. Wait. I think suddenly TJ lurked to the side towards the trash can on the other side of the bathroom of Chloe. Douglas got the picture, holding him by his shirt and, and one arm just in time for TJ to empty his stomach onto the receptacle. His twin grasped and heaved uncontrollably, only staying upright because of Douglas's grip on him. Douglas tried not to feel sick himself. This had to be the most messed up, awkward situation he had ever been in. And yet, his prior anger had began to fade away the more TJ seemed to struggle. All he had was each other right now. No adults, no help. And this was his brother, after all. An agonizing minute or so passed before the fit appeared to have run its course. TJ shook in earnest now from the exertion. Eyes and nose streaming, sweat plastering his hairline, Douglas slipped his shoulders onto the TJ's arm. Come on, let's get you some water to get rid of that taste, and then I'll get something to cool you down, he coaxed. His back was not happy with the awkward angle it took to support TJ so he could reach the drinking fountain. Not that it could be helped. Once that was over, he got TJ situated against the wall again and hurried into the bathroom. Paper towels were probably the best bet. Douglas to spend a good supply, folded and soaked in a cup, soaked a couple, and then went back out. TJ had closed his eyes, though he was still upright. Hey, stay with me. If we can't be sure what you took, then we gotta wait the stuff out. I'm not gonna be responsible for you slipping into a coma or something. Douglas gently shook, shook TJ's arm. TJ grimaced, so tired. I know, I am too. I'm gonna need to fish out some cash in a bit and try out that coffee machine. Maybe a snack. You may be sweating right now, but I'm still freezing from running around outside. Uh, don't mention food right now. Can I just lay down? Tell you what, stay awake while I get some stuff set up. We'll finish getting into some dry clothes, and I'll let you lay down, okay? Just keep yourself going until then. Here, the outlet's right next to you. Get my phone plugged in while you wait. 
Douglas's extremities were beginning to go numb despite the relative warmth of the little shelter. Dry clothes first. Both of them had really only packed the change out of their suits from inauguration, so those would have to do. He hung their goats on dry knobs and laid his jeans close to one of the heaters. I gave him the idea to put the wet paper towels by the door for a while to make them colder. Then he pulled out TJ's clothes. His brother was more thoroughly soaked, but had only gotten as far as his shoes and sweatshirt. Of course, he wasn't happy to have Douglas looking at the rest. Not a baby. Well, unless you're going to start moving around more, it's not going to happen by itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Help me out here. Which much, with much grumbling and more awkward maneuvers, they got TJ into his suit pants and undershirt. Enough of their initial snow, snowy tracks had dried up to be able to walk around in dress socks without too much trouble. Douglas counted about 20 bucks between their wallets, a few of which he went for a piping hot cup of coffee, a Snickers bar for himself, and some plain snack crackers for TJ. He also retrieved one of the paper towels. I don't think I can handle food right now, groaned TJ. They're just for easy reach when you think you're ready. Here, lean onto this. Douglas had one blanket wrapped around himself. He mostly unfolded the other one so TJ could lay down with his head in Douglas' lap, as well as have a layer for cover. Heberous as he was, his wiry frame still shook with chills, and he was too out of it to protest. Douglas pressed the cold paper down, uh, cold paper towel to his brother's head. How's that? A little better? Head and stomach not so unsteady like this? TJ's pulse was still faster than Douglas liked. On his other side, his phone blinked that it was charging, but the screen said no signal. Great. He flipped on the storm radio just to have something to listen to. His choices were static. A 30 minus or so second soundbite of the current weather conditions and warnings on repeat, and a trucker station that faded in and out. Around 2 a.m., according to his watch, TG agreed to try some crackers. T Go Douglas got a second cup of coffee, rinsing the first out to have some water on hand, and switched out the paper towels. The new one had to be re wetted, but it was good and cold. I'm sorry about this, the, his brother mumbled as the radio voice reduced to a buzz for a few seconds. Why can't change, we can't change the past, and there's nothing we can do about the storm. So we just try to keep going. Any luck with your phone? Signal's about as bad as the radio. Last time I flipped over to the weather, though, it said this thing's supposed to clear up around up by around 6. Once my phone's finished charging, I was going to plug yours in to have another one handy, see if it has better luck. TJ squirmed. He couldn't seem to get comfortable no matter how either of them tried to adjust. They spent several minutes like this with only spotty commercials in the background, until TJ's face contorted and he steadily tried to throw up the blanket. I got a further explanation was cut off by having a clap his a hand to his mouth. Uh, once again, Douglas provided the speed and coordination TJ lacked. This was a less clean save, however. The first disgustingly chunky bits hit the rim of the can as they reached it. TJ moaned pitifully between bouts of wrenching, a sound that really tore Douglas' heart. No matter who was to blame for them ending up this way, he hated, seeing, he hated seeing his twin brother so miserable and unable to stop it. Uh, that was horrible, TJ finally croaked. His voice echoing slightly, that given that he had his hand resting on one arm, draced across the back of the trash can rim. He spent every so often trying to breathe normally. Take your time. I'm not going anywhere, replied Douglas. One hand on TJ's back to make sure he didn't fall over. TJ made a noise that was dangerously close to tearful. We might need to move. You feeling lightheaded? Something else, or you're not done. You just need to be able to sit. We could try to make it to the bathroom, D Douglas guessed frantically. Oh, bathroom, yeah, but it's because we might have another mess to worry about. Douglas run, rung out, blank, brain clicked, and he hauled TJ up with a new burst of energy. TJ whimpered from the jostling. Douglas steered him to the handicap stall, even though it was the farthest one. Why that one? If you pass out, I'm not willing, I'm not pilling, piling into a tiny stall to get you. There are bars to hold onto and plenty of room. You're not staying in there with me, dude. That's record gross, which is saying something given tonight's track record. What do you what do what you need to do? I'm gonna get some water and then I will wait right here outside to make sure you're okay. Don't lock that door in case I have to come in after you. Not sure I could work it right now if I wanted. This is getting beyond terrifying, which no sleep, no medical knowledge, no clue as to what's going was happening. Douglas honestly wondered if his brother was dying. He snatched his phone to take with him. Despite it being doubtful, he would get better reception in the bathroom rather than the lobby. He grabbed one of the blankets for what it was worth and topped up the water on his way back. Inside the towel room, all was quiet except for TJ's hitched breathing. You still in one piece? Douglas asked tentatively. He tried his best to ignore the snub. You mean I've been in one piece up till now? 
What can I say? Drugs are bad for you. Drugs are bad. Okay. Ah, uh, shut up, jerk. His tone was a sh shade toward lighthearted. However, Douglas would take whatever victory he could get at the moment. I got water for you. Whatever you want it. Not sure I can keep anything down right now. You gotta try out something. We can hold off on the crackers, but at some point you're gonna need fluids. What if I got you a Gatorade? TJ let out a grunt that may or may not have been a suppressed gag. They laughed in the silence. Douglas set up the cup just under the salt par uh, parishion. Hopefully close enough for TJ to reach. I stood with his back against the nearest wall. He tried to ease his state of mild panic by focusing on the sound of TJ's breathing. Labored though it was, his phone hovered around one bar. Which wouldn't be of any use. It could mean he might have a better chance out in the lobby, but he wasn't going to budge until he knew TJ was okay. Douglas only realized he had started to nod off when the room suddenly echoed with the blast of a flushing toilet. His head snapped up so quickly it hit the towel behind him, eliciting a pain strain of swearing. His watch ju read just past 3 o'clock. Then he wrenched his attention back to the source of the disturbance. TJ, how are you doing? The rustling of clothes, clothing was his only answer at first. The fumble click of a belt buckle, a pause, and the sound of someone falling against the stall fixtures, Douglas up to his feet. TJ! Uh, unnecessary... Unnecessary recap. What is a man? A miserable little pile of... <sighs> Sorry, I just wanna... I just wanna... Come on! No, let me silence my goddamn phone! I don't wanna hear... Dracula shouting, what is a man? Okay. TJ looked dazed, crumpled against the far wall. He faced Douglas, arms askew as he tried to catch himself on the handicap bar. The side of his left hand was bleeding, possibly from a corner of the metal toilet paper dispenser. A red welt rapidly surfaced on his forehead. <clears throat> he must have glanced the wall on the way down. TJ, can you hear me? Hey, hang in there. We're going to get through this, okay? It's going to be all right, rambled Douglas. Apparently, this was the last straw. TJ simply broke down, all out sobbing within seconds. He was sheet white from being sick, clammy, dark circles under his eyes, and trembling. His shirt front was stained with, from leaning over the trash can, lips dry and cracked, eyes bloodshot when they weren't squeezed shut with how hard he cried. His breathing came in racked gas. Douglas sank down beside him, holding a wad of toilet paper to, cut, to the cut on TJ's hand, and pulling him into a side hug. Who cared? It's not like there was anyone else to see him. I can't take any more, Dougie. I mean, I, I know it's my fault, but it, but it's it's been it's been this bad. It's not so and don't worry about it right now. I got you. I'm right here, you and me. I just wish it would. TJ fought for air, end already. Just let it end. It'll be over before you know it, and you'll be fine. Not, not just this, Dougie, mom, mom, and d dad, and the pictures, and stories, and the pressure. I hate it. It hurts so much. I just wish I could stop it. Stop it all. Those last words plunged down Douglas's back like ice. He had no idea if TJ even knew what he was saying. By all appearances, he had never shown such an inclination tonight or any other night. And yet, this emotion had to be built up somewhere. First term, second term... Each new affair of the dad's, involuntary coming out of the closet, all the schedules and protocols and expectations. One guess was as good as the next. It was enough to screw up anyone for life. Douglas just wished he knew why it hit TJ so hard, so much harder than himself. Listen, it's going to get better. We're finally going to get a little to live on our, our own lives. We can do what it takes to get you clean, so the stuff isn't hanging over your head. We'll figure it out. He said softly. TJ took some time to get himself together a little. It's never really going to end, is it? Mom and Dad aren't just going to quit politics. It's what they live for. People will still talk about Dad's affair long after the fact. And if he never does it again, how much you want to bet on that? I'll always be the novelty, queer druggie of the White House. So what we are. We, this screwed up family. Stop talking like that. We're not perfect. Probably far from it, relatively speaking. But we can't let that be the only way we define ourselves. Okay. Douglas paused to check on the cut and where TJ hit his head. Neither looked too bad in the scope of things. He also pulled away just far enough to grab the blanket from underneath the, a jar stall door. Rest here for a while. If you're feeling up to it in a bit, we can try heading out to the rest of the stuff. Sure you don't want to try some water? TJ nodded, utterly exhausted. Douglas settled into the corner so he didn't have to brace TJ by himself. Blanket, blanket draped over both of them. 
TJ leaned over so his head rested on Douglas's shoulder from the side. He still had chills, but they weren't as quite as pronounced. Weren't quite as pronounced. Dougie? Yeah, TJ? Thank you. I know this has to be the worst night of your life. It's definitely mine, even after being pulled out of the closet. But you didn't hesitate for anything. I just wanted to say that I'm grateful for that. Anything for you, bro. As long as you don't go making this a habit. TJ shouted, snorted, and almost laughed. Douglas smiled. Take it easy for a bit. It was a small movement that made all the di difference. Barely a stir. Might not be worth checking up, even. Wait, waking up? Douglas jerked upright, in itself not a huge move as only his head had slipped to the side. His cheek felt numb, having been fortunately unstuck from the cold tile after apparently resting that way for a while. He checked his watch, almost 6.30 in the morning. It was his heart that truly jumped to into action, remembering that he had vowed to stay awake in case anything else happened to TJ. His twin brother was the one who had stared first. His face twisted in, in discomfort, but otherwise nothing was out of place. Well, aside from the fact that they sat on the floor for a rest stop bathroom, wait, forced to wait out a snowstorm. Hey, TJ, wakey, wakey, Douglas groaned, trying to stre stretch while moving TJ as little as possible. TJ reflectively sucked in a deep breath, perhaps less hampered than he had been for the last few hours. <sighs> You're doing okay? Hurts. I bet we're both pretty cramped up after do dozing off on the bathroom floor. No. Hurts. Douglas instantly went on alert. What hurts? What's wrong? Stomach. Head. Chest. Muscles. Just. Ache. TJ's expression flinched as he tried to shift position. Still feeling nauseous. Not as much. What if I got you out to the lobby and you could lay down for real again? Maybe take some me pain medications for the first aid kit. TJ shrugged, so Douglas took that as a yes. Tossing up the blanket and bracing himself... If for a few minutes of cold, he slowly got both of them to their feet. The side where they had slumped together was soaked with sweat, but TJ didn't feel quite so feverish anymore. They made the journey without incident, though TJ was barely relieved to sit down again. Oh, visibly relieved, my bad. <laughs> Douglas surveyed the situation. Don't lay down just yet. Let's get you into a cleanest shirt first. You can have my undershirt from yesterday. Huh? Oh, yeah. TJ processed out loud, looking down at his front. He allowed Douglas to help him with a t-shirt switch, followed by his own dress shirt just to have something over his arms. The clothes he had been wearing when they arrived here was still damp. Douglas stuffed a few relatively dry items into one of their backpacks, and set it up at the head of the still half-folded blanket on the floor so TJ wouldn't have a pillow of sorts. How's that? Not a bad nurse. For a straight guy, mumbled TJ. <laughs> the corners of his mouth twitching upwards. Douglas tapped his shoulder with a loose fist. That girls can't be choosers, but I'm glad it's helping. You think you can drink enough water to take a couple more uh, Motrin or something from the kit? TJ contemplated this for a moment or two, then slowly nodded. Douglas stiffly rose, retrieved the other blanket and cup of water from the bathroom, and grabbed the little travel first aid box. TJ took the, bill, the pills without too much difficulty, which hopefully would stay that way. Douglas also took a piece of gauze from some medical tape to cover the cut on TJ's hand. The welt on his forehead was a dark, blotchy purple, but nothing more than that. You relax for a while. Just let me know if anything doesn't feel right. I'm going to get a couple things for myself, okay? What time is it? 6.30. Going on 7. It'll be getting light out before too long. Douglas fished some more cash. Uh, Douglas fished out some more cash, my bad. Deciding on Pop-Tarts, a trail mix bar, and one more cup of coffee. The lobby was drafty with his glass doors on either end. Improvised breakfast in hand, he wrapped up in the other blanket with his back against the wall. The radio hum point, hummed pointlessly, so he switched it off. TJ watched him, more alert than he had been in hours. You know, this would be almost like a fun camping adventure, but I didn't feel like crap. Sounds like you're in a better mood, so at least maybe not as crappy as you felt earlier. True, I was kind of in and out of it for a lot of it, which made it worse, I think. Must have been bad if I managed to fall asleep sitting like that. We were both pretty worn out by then. But I said some wild stuff, though. You never know what's going to... What's going to ramble out when you're, uh, you know. Yeah, agreed Douglas. He didn't have the heart to ask exactly how much TJ remembered. This had to be the most relaxed moment of the whole, whole ordeal. And anyway, perhaps it was for the best that some things had, uh, I'm butchering this sentence. Perhaps it was be for the best that some things be left for to the blankness of drug fog. Rapid beeping tunes are both of them. TJ's phone, which it was still plugged in, suddenly came to life. 
Screen to played mom, Douglas froze. Oh gosh, it's gonna kill us. TG half rose and twisted around. What's up? No, you stay put. I'll try and think of something. <clears throat> Swallowing hard, nervous energy driving him to his feet. Douglas hit the green button before he can go to voicemail. Hey mom, TJ, or Douglas, it's hard to tell on the phone. As long as you two are in the same place, are you all right? Lane's voice rambled over the phone. We're safe, Mom, and it's Dougie. Carolyn Peterson just called me asking if we heard from you. Something about TJ feeling sick, and you two leaving early to stay at your grandmother's. But she's still here with us, and nobody was picking up on the house phone. And with cell service so spotty, I promise, Mom, we're okay. TJ's phone must have somehow got be get better reception than mine. He threw a wide glance at TJ, who snickered. We tried to go to Nana's, except we couldn't find the spare key to get in. So we didn't know what to do, and, well, we thought we could make it home with the city shutting down local roads. Oh my god, Douglas, we could have rather dealt with the ticket to get you back to the Petersons. They tried to drive here anyway, but I'll tell you guys in a minute. Their mom alternated taking, talking, and spot, talking over the phone and updating everyone in the room with her. Please tell me you haven't been stuck, stuck in the snow all night. This is exactly why I vouch for anything except sports cars. Don't look at me like that, bud. I was perfectly right. No, we got to a rest stop. Well, I mean, we slid into a snow drift at the rest stop, so we couldn't get anywhere after that. But the car is fine. We got inside fine. You could be happy that everything you made us keep in the trunk came in handy. And how's TJ? Hi, Mom. TJ. <laughs> Chived in hoarsely. It's been a rough few hours. Whatever it was, bad food, stomach bug, it better not be something I can catch after taking care of him all night, Douglas deflected. Though his look was more pointed at his brother this time. He's doing a little better, though. I still want you to call 911. If you haven't already, just to be safe, I don't know how long you'll be stuck before we can try and get to you. The major roads are supposed to be okay for the most part. It's the rest that might be the problem. And they'll be better equipped to get the car unstuck in any case. You took the 95, right? Yeah, it's that tiny rest stop just past the border. And don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Just because you don't have to shut down the interstate for you anymore, doesn't mean you have to jump in the middle of every little thing that happens. That's what parents do, Douglas, especially when the little thing could have gone a lot worse. Keep us updated. We love you both. Douglas sighed as he lowered the phone. You lied to her, TJ commented. Newsflash, not the first time. I mean, you really got out of your way to avoid mentioning drugs or picking me up at the club to anyone. Maybe I thought the fact that she was already freaked out about letting us go to the party and then drive herself home was bad enough to avoid scaring her more. The Petersons just didn't need to know. It's not like I want to broadcast that you do this stuff. Besides, what to say it wasn't really a bad stomach bug. The expression on TJ's face floated, between somewhere between uh, floated somewhere between gratitude, guilt, and just plain relief. I am, I really am sorry I dragged you out this whole mess. I would do anything I could for you. You know that. I know. I just wish you didn't have to. TJ settled back down, apparently drained for the moment. Douglas punched the numbers for the next call. 911, what's your, what is your emergency? Said, they, said the female voice at the end. Hi, my brother and I were at a party last night, and we tried to get home before the storm got too bad, but we got stranded. Are you in a safe place? Yes, we got stuck. We got to the rest stop off 95 going south, so we had food, water, heat, no problem. It's one by the Virginia state line. Our car is probably buried at this point, but my brother got sick. We don't know if it was something he ate or what. We got a hold of our parents, but they want and they wanted us to call you. A good suggestion on your parents' part. We want as many people as possible to stay off the roads for the time being. Can you tell me how your brother is doing right now? He's awake, a lot better than he was last night. Hasn't tried to eat or drink much for a few hours. TJ threw him a petulant look. Was he throwing up or anything? Pretty much everything. Douglas told her, mouthing sorry, the TJ. He was really shaky, maybe dizzy, but like he had a fever for a while. Did he ever lose consciousness? He dozed off some, and we got a couple hours of sleep. No passing out or anything, though. Keep trying to push fluids, even small amounts at a time. But don't force it if he can't keep anything down. And I know it sounds backwards, but try to keep him as warm as possible. I'll pass what you told me on to the EMTs. We'll get help to you as soon as possible. Okay? Do you need anything? Do you need me to stay on the line? How long do you think it'll take? Near station is about 20 minutes away from you. Probably a bit longer to get through the snow. Highway patrol is going to be closer to an hour to get a tow truck. I think we'll be okay until then. Like I said, he seems to be doing better. Can I get a phone number in case the, EMT, the officers or the EMTs need to reach you? Douglas gave her both cell phone numbers, and they hung up. Well, now we know. Well, now we wait some more. How's your stomach feeling? Think you could try some more water? I can work on it. Do you really have to share the details? Called an emergency for a reason. 
I don't think, I think they need to know how bad it is before, if they're sending an ambulance out to you. Just work on the water thing, we're almost out of here. I, for one, will take a moment to relish the idea of making it to an astronaut bed. He realized he had spent the entirety of the both conversations on his feet pacing and sat down again. Okay. Get to this last chapter. It's only six, it has said only six chapters. Okay. No. 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 Don't respond. We finished the story. Elaine twisted her gloves between her hands as flashing lights came into view. It was fully light out, allowing them to take in the whole endeavor. There was a tow truck, which had just pulled a white Mustang from the impressive snow drip around it. Two patrol cars blocking the exit lane, a snowplow, which seemed to be preparing to leave, and an ambulance, of course. Her heart leapt into her throat as they passed the scene by, but took one, one of her hands in a firm grip. We'll be over there before you know it, Sugar, he said. He just has to catch the next exit to swing around. The professionals have everything under control. But we don't know that for sure from here, he, she lamented. Half the night all alone in a drop to way section, uh, station, with TJ sick, heaven only knows what that meant, and no supplies to speak of. We should have said no to the party, made them come home with us when they heard the weather forecast. Sugar, they're not three-year-olds anymore. We got lucky and had the Secret Service to keep them reined in for years. The vast majority of parents don't get that luxury. They're going to want to take on life for themselves, make their own decisions, and all we can do is teach them what we can and wait for them to come home. There was a real possibility they wouldn't have to come home in this case. They would have been getting seriously hurt or shh, you're getting carried away with yourself. They'll be smiling and laughing when we get there. Just you see. It was strange how only having two cars on the trip. One for them and an agent in the front. And one with the other agent and a staff member who had offered to take the boy's car back. If it was drivable, they looped around the exit easily. And within a couple minutes, they had stopped in front of the patrol cars at the rest stop. I'm sorry, sir. The facility is temporarily close to one of the troopers. Excuse me, Elaine called out before her window was fully rolled down. Our apologies, officer. Perhaps you recognize myself and the husband. We've been, we've usually been accompanied by much more obvious transportation. Those are our sons in there. The apology is all mine, ma'am. Sir, give us a minute to move the cars and we'll let you in. Someone had shoveled parts of the walk in front of the little building to allow for easier maneuvering. Both of them practically ran to the glass door. The inside was absolutely, dis was in absolute disarray. Clothes and blankets strewn about. Plus the EMT gear and the crew themselves huddled around a lowered gurney. Mom, Dad, Douglas waved them over. He was wrapped in one of the silver emergency blankets, clearly exhausted but otherwise fine. Leaning across the gurney from the far wall, TJ smiled warily at them from under his own cover, one arm exposed with an IED secured to it. My boys, thank God you're alive, excla exclaimed Elaine, brushing between the EMTs to hug both teenagers at once. She couldn't begin to describe her relief at being able to feel how warm and solid they were. Douglas embraced her in return. I told you we were doing fine, he reassured her. That doesn't mean I still I wasn't still worried sick. She pulled back just enough to take full stock of TJ's conditions. How are you feeling, sweetie? Do you do they need to take you to the hospital or anything? He was noticeably paler than usual, except for a stark purple welt above his left temple. Eyes shadowy and hair sticking out in uh, odd angles from yesterday's gel and dried sweat. His temperature might be a little high, but not by much. Under the blanket, he was back in the unbuttoned dress shirt with a t-shirt underneath that. We figured it was just short-term stomach bug or something similar, one of the technicians explained. He was dehydrated, so we gave him some fluids, and they reported a slip in the bathroom at one point. He just got dizzy for a minute, D Douglas cut in. Elaine's eyes went wide, minor bump on the forehead, and a small cut on one hand, that's all. Anyway, we don't see any reason why you can't take both of them home. Just get them some real foods, hot shower, and a good long rest. They'll, ba they'll bounce back in no time. Thank you all so much. We can't begin to thank you enough, lauded Bud. But you got resourceful boys, Mr. President. It's them you should be praising, said the other tech. But both were clearly in awe at the present and unexpected company. Douglas here did everything he was supposed to do, given what they had to work with. I would, however, recommend putting a few sandbags in that trunk of yours to get a little better traction on the winter roads. Blushing wildly, Douglas nodded. Elaine eyed, eyed the IV bag, which was not quite half empty. How much longer do you think he'll need that? For now, the more, the better. But he doesn't have, it, have all of it. We need to take care of some paperwork, and the troopers will probably want a complete report as well. But names will be kept need to know only. You should be good to go once everything's squared away, replied the first tech. How about you, sugar? I'll take the officers. I'll take uh, I'll take the officers, bus suggested. Dougie, I know you had a long night, but think you can get all this cleared up so we can get it to the cars? Douglas nodded, giving TJ's knees a squeeze before standing up. Yes, sir. 
Some of the stuff might not be all that way dry, just so you know for when we get home. We'll come to that when we get there. Come on, I think it's time for you go boys to get some real rest. Once the formalities were taken care of, their things loaded, and the boys bundled up warmly. Everyone started heading out. The staffer had already left with the Mustang. Bud helped support TJ to one car, where Elaine climbed in the middle to sit between their sons, before taking his own seat in the second car. I'm really sorry about all this, TJ said meekly. He fussed with the medical tape around his elbow, trying to keep it or the gauze from filling up. We both are, Douglas seconded. The important thing is, it's over, and you're both safe and sound. That's all your father and I can ask, Elaine slipped an arm around each of them, hugging them close again. To her surprise, they didn't squirm or complain when being too, about being too old for such, for such affection. Before too long, they were both fast asleep, asleep on her shoulders. No matter how big they got, she would always cherish moments like this when she could get them. Finn, so that's the story. I actually, I actually think this is a really good story. Um, it has a lot of, it's basically two brothers trying to survive the night in harsh weather. You know, nothing, nothing too, nothing too big, but the execution was done pretty well. The hurt comfort coming from, you know, having to deal with all the, the drug problems and TG obviously having problems with all this pressure coming from being, being, whose father is the president of the United States. You know, that's always a real issue. Like when you're, when you're related to someone famous, there's always some kind of pressure. So it's very realistic. Uh, I really did like the execution. I like the pacing. Um, the, the two characters, Douglas and TJ, they played off each other pretty well. Uh, I really liked it. I actually give, I would give it a five out of five because it was that good. I think maybe it could have went on a little longer, just a little, maybe another extra, maybe a couple, another couple thousand words, but then I would actually have to review it, not do a reading of it. But overall, I think it's I think it's pretty good. I think it's really really good. Um, I'm not. I don't really care. I don't really know anything about political animals, but it's a good story. Like I don't. I have nothing wrong with it. The only thing you know I would have to complain is is the pills, but that's less anything critiquing the author and more. I just can't pronounce it. <laughs> I can't pronounce that name. I, I I just can't. So I really do like. I, again, I like the story. It's very good. Uh, this has been Dark Symphony 777, and I shall see you next time, and cut.